We don't do anything else. Just ice all day. So cataracts. A lot of people think, well, different things are cataracts. Just like a lot of people think LASIK is every eye surgery ever. And there are different types, you know, people think cataracts are macular degeneration, dryest, things like that. But what we're focusing on is this lens that sits right behind the colored part of the eye, the iris. Over time, just with normal aging processes, glasses don't fix the problem. A LASIK procedure, which is a laser on the front surface of the eye, also doesn't fix the problem. And so it's time to explore you know, cataract surgery. Is there anything that can be done to slow the progression of cataracts? Yes. I mean, certainly diet and exercise are actually important. A healthy diet filled with antioxidants, vegetables, um, less processed sugars, things like that have been shown to decrease the, uh, the incidence of cataracts. UV protection, so wearing your sunglasses when you're outside decreases cataracts. Uh, there's argument, you know, you've seen a lot probably about those blue blocking lenses. You know, we sit, we sit at the computer all the time, we're getting exposed to a lot of blue light. Is that causing cataracts? I don't think there's anything definitive out there, you know, just yet that says wearing these blue blocking lenses will help you decrease your incidence of cataracts or macular degeneration. What we do know is those blue blockers do help with uh, regulating your circadian rhythm. So that's why people say don't lie on your cell phone in bed at night because that blue light tells your brain that it's daytime and it's time to wake up. Uh, the blood to the cataracts or to the lens? So, no blood supply to the lens. We need it to be crystal clear. And so if we have blood vessels growing into that area, you can't see through it. And so it gets the nutrients actually from what's called the aqueous. Your eye creates a fluid that creates the eye pressure. And the aqueous actually bend, bathes that lens uh, with all the nutrients that it needs. And so that's where you get that from. And the aqueous is also very low in proteins, things like that. The eye is set up to be as clear as possible, to let that light be as unfiltered as possible getting back there. So you've probably heard my cataract's ripe or my cataract's not ripe, so I can't have cataract surgery. I, I, we think that's kind of antiquated at this point in time, because what is ripe, really? It's different for different people. It really comes down to your symptoms. And so we see some people occasionally who come in, they've got 20-20 vision, but they say, you know, the quality's just not where it, where it needs to be. I get glare at night. Uh, in low lighting conditions, I can hardly see anything. Okay, well, it's ripe for that person. You know, I have someone else who has, you know, not many visual demands, their vision's say 2040, 2050, and I say, that cataract's ready. They say, no, I'm not having any problems with my vision. Okay, well, for that person, their cataract's not ripe. It comes down to you as an individual and how it's impacting you on a day-to-day -day basis. Cataract surgery. Yeah. Totally comprehend your comparison there. However, insurers, how do they it? That's a good question. Um, and there, there's not any strict guidelines as far as your visual acuity for the insurance. Oftentimes, even if you're seeing well, we can do a glare test on you, which is basically simulating you driving at night and headlights coming at you, uh, which is a real concern. I mean, you can sit in our perfectly lit room and read just fine off of the chart. But it's dangerous out there if you, you know, you're, you're driving at night and you're suddenly blinded by that. And so we'll shine a bright light. It's called a brightness acuity test or glare testing. We shine a bright light at you and then say read the chart. And oftentimes your vi we'll see your vision drop precipitously uh, from that. And that demonstrates to the insurance companies that you're having issues with that. Including Medicare. Including Medicare. Primarily Medicare. Everyone else bases what they do off of Medicare. So. Cataract surgery, 
is the most commonly performed surgery in the United States. The actual procedure takes about 10 minutes. We do one eye at a time, usually a couple weeks between the two. You're not completely, you know, you're not under general anesthesia, you're under monitored anesthesia care. We give you not even an injection anymore, we give you a little lozenge under your tongue that puts you in a nice relaxed state. Once you're ready for the procedure, they take you into the, the surgery center and your job is to look at a light. If you can handle looking at a light for 10 minutes, you can have cataract surgery successfully. Um, there's no pain associated with the procedure. Uh, we do have an anesthesiologist, so if you are particularly nervous or, you know, on the off chance you say, you know what, I do feel something, there's someone there to take care of you and make sure that you're comfortable. And if you're not comfortable, it's going to be a challenging procedure all the way around, and so that's our number one priority. Yeah? Um, in comparison to LASIK, uh -huh. is it, as far as the pain, the timing, all of that, about the same? Similar. You know, it's interesting that you bring that up with LASIK. So with both, both procedures, it's usually that first week that there are some precautions. You know, you wear a shield at night. You can't get water in the eyes. You tell you not to rub the eyes or heavy lifting. And that's the same between you know, LASIK and a, a cataract procedure. Uh, we do have a drop that we use once a day for 30 days after the procedure. Now, it's interesting because prior, the way we did this prior was there were three different drops four times a day. And so that's 12 drops a day. Let's say you're doing it in both eyes, that's 24 drops a day for a month, which is a lot. Now, we've got it down to one drop a day. We've compounded, we work with a compounding pharmacy. We use an antibiotic, a steroid, and a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory all in one, and you use it once a day for a month. We also put some medication into the eye during the surgery, so it decreases the amount that you have to use after the surgery. It's just a heck of a lot more convenient. Not to make you crazy, no. contraindication for this type of procedure post LASIK? No. Now, if you've had LASIK, it does change some of our measurements that we make. Um, because the cornea is not in its natural state, you know, it's been flattened by the laser, sometimes our measurements are a little different that we take to calculate the lens that we need to put into the eye. And oftentimes we'll recommend uh, doing something during the procedure called Aura, the OptiWave Refractive Analyzer that we use. And it can actually assist us in real time of picking that lens. We actually remove the cataract and this machine takes measurements in real time that shows us exactly what your prescription is and what lens that we need to put in. So it just helps us nail that accuracy uh, with you know, more, uh, not more challenging eyes, but when we're not as 100% of the accuracy of the measurements, we repeat it again during the surgery. Yes? You have three cataracts in one eye. Do you remove all of them? Some of them? Types of cataracts in one eye? All come, they're all affecting that lens. And so what happened, the lens is held within a capsule. If you imagine, well the capsules, the, uh, the outer shell of your M&M, what we're doing, we remove the front surface of that outer shell, we take all the chocolate out, which is your lens in the cataract, uh, and then we put the new lens right back in, into that empty shell there. Now, people often do have multiple types of cataracts in their eye at the same time. The most common is called a nuclear cataract, where the lens just turns yellow. But you can have spokes, a cortical cataract. You can have a frost on the back, a posterior subcapsular cataract. Those are all removed simultaneously. And the crystal clear lens is put in there. Yep. It's it's actually broken up with sound waves okay. and vacuumed out at the same time. Mm 
And so it's broken up and removed piece by piece. And the new lens is folded up like a burrito through the same main incision, which is 2.6 millimeters in size. That lens is opened up right in there and you've replaced that cloudy lens with the crystal clear lens. Now it's important that all the pieces of that lens are removed because that lens, when it's held in that capsule, it's what we call immune privileged. Your body's immune system can't touch it. But say it gets out of that capsule and it's sitting in your eye, your immune system attacks it. And so we're very careful to, you know, everyone's very careful to remove all those pieces of the cataract. And the steroid that's in the drunks? Yes. You need to any weight, weight change? You know, good question because steroids are fantastic, but they have a list of side effects that are about as long as your arm. With the topical medications though, the amount that gets into your system is so negligible, it doesn't really have that sort of effect on you. Especially at once a day, and especially short term, you're using it just for a month. And so you don't have to worry about any of those systemic side effects. Steroids with the eyes, two things typically that we watch for. Well, steroids can cause cataracts in your eyes. Well, not for you. If you just had cataract surgery, you're not going to get a second cataract. It can also raise the eye pressure. And so that's something we watch. On the rare event that your pressure goes up with that steroid drop after the cataract surgery, we just add something else into the mix, uh, a drop to use during while you're using the, the surgical drop to lower that eye pressure as well. Make sure. So. When you have the cataract surgery, it's a little bit different than most of your other surgical procedures. You know, if you need a knee replacement, you need a knee replacement. You don't get to choose which knee replacement you have or what you want that knee replacement to do. You get a knee replacement. With cataract surgery, you actually have some options about what you want your vision to be like after the surgical procedure. And so, we have a, a procedure called BASIC. And BASIC is, this is what's covered with your insurance. You pay the deductible, you pay the copay, and you get your cataract lens out. We measure you the best we can, oftentimes just trying to correct your distance vision, but it doesn't correct any astigmatism or things like that. And we tell you, you're probably gonna need glasses for your best vision, distance, and near moving forward. But I stole this from Dr. Wiley, the same old boring winner. Yeah, it's th that doesn't mean it's a bad lens. It's a great quality lens. Your vision's gonna be improved by getting that cataract out of the way. You're gonna get the same surgical procedure you would have if you got a multifocal lens or an astigmatism correcting lens. Your vision's going to be better getting that cataract out of the way. You just have to plan on wearing glasses afterwards. And for a lot of people, that's not a big deal. So don't think that if you just want basic, you're not you know, doing, your, you're doing yourself an injustice or anything. Your vision's going to be improved and you're gonna get a great outcome. Does that change your prescription on your glasses? It does, actually. Get a new pair of glasses. Yeah, let's see. You look, are you a little nearsighted? <laughs> Can't read that. All right, perfect. <laughs> and so we would oftentimes aim you for, we take the measurements and pick the lens that would best approach your distance vision. And so put, taking out your human lens and putting in a new lens will change your prescription afterwards. So you probably have to go to the glass too. Yeah. Depending what your mm -hmm. you feel about it. And the insurance companies and I don't know a lot about insurance, but oftentimes, even if it's medical, after the surgical procedure, they have certain allowances for a pair of glasses afterwards. Yes? Thank you. Any issues with monovision? No, we do monovision quite frequently. Uh, monovision's definitely an option as far as moving forward. And so what she means by monovision is, it, it sounds strange, but your brain can normally figure it out. Your dominant eye is set up for distance, and your non-dominant eye is set up for a near target. And so if you walk around doing this, you'll definitely be able to tell the difference, but most of us, about 95% of people, our brains can adapt to that pretty easily. You know, myself, this eye is nearsighted, this eye sees distance, and I don't wear glasses. Yeah? Well, can you 
cataract surgery do anything for floaters and or double vision? No. But we have something for floaters and double vision. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so the floaters, let's see. Cataracts are here. The floaters are actually proteins that are in this gel back here. And as light shines through, they cast shadows on the back of the eye, and that's what you see as your floaters. Most people notice them occasionally, and it's no big deal. But if you've got floaters that are just driving you crazy, which happens, it depends on the size, the location, the density, and you know your brain, there are a couple different things that can be done. Uh, Dr. Pierre, we'll come back to him about your double vision too, but Dr. Pierre uh, does a procedure called a YAG vitreolysis. And so if you have one kind of big chunky floater that's really bothering you, he can actually use a laser to break that up into little pieces. It's like taking a block of ice. It doesn't you know, make it disappear. But say if you took your block of ice and made it into little chips, it'd be able to sort of dissipate and get out of the way. And so it's just a laser procedure that he does with that. Now, if you're someone who's got multiple big cloudy floaters, or they're kind of smoky looking floaters, or this too close to the back of the eye, uh, there's a procedure called a vitrectomy. Uh, we work with a group very closely called Retina Associates. And there's a procedure called a vitrectomy where they can actually go in there and remove that gel and remove all the floaters as well. Uh, both of which are and they're safe procedures and they're very successful. Now as far as double vision, well, if you have an eye misalignment, there are multiple ways to you know, fix your double vision. I'm putting prism in a pair of glasses yeah, right now. <laughs> it helps to fix the double vision. It just allows your eyes to rest where they need to be and bring those images together. In certain cases, uh, a muscle surgery can be done too. So each eye is controlled by six muscles. And Dr. Pierre, he's our pediatric specialist. He does the YAG laser. Um, he does cataract surgeries. But he also does these muscle surgeries where you can actually move where the muscles insert onto the eye to help align those. Now, some people aren't good candidates for him, but if you want to find out, I mean, he, he, he's our jack of all trades, Dr. Pierre, as you can tell. So, and you'll know when he's in the building because you'll hear kids crying. So, <laughs> yeah. Does Medicare cover floater surgery? If we can say that it's impacting your life on a day-to-day -day basis, it's not a cosmetic procedure. You know, you're not, you're not having, choosing surgery just for fun. You're, if you're considering a surgical procedure, then it's it's a medical procedure. It's getting in the way of your vision on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, I've had this vitreous detachment. Yeah. So I've got Is it driving you nuts? Sometimes. That's the, that's the question, you know. Is it driving you nuts enough that you'd want to consider a surgical procedure for it? I would think that you'd at least want to consider, you know, having an evaluation for it. Um, is it one floater in particular or a bunch of floaters that are bothering you? It comes and goes, but I've been yeah. told that it is kind of risky and not worth doing it. The way that it's done now, the vitrectomy procedure, which is the surgical procedure, yeah. uh, it's, I would say it's about as risky as cataract surgery, which you know, it's a surgical procedure. There are risks involved, but they're low. Uh, the laser procedure, on the other hand, that YAG vitreolysis that Dr. Pierre does, even less risk. They're not going into the eye. It's a laser procedure. And so there's not r the risk of infection by going into the eye or retinal detachment, anything like that. Let's see. So talked about that. You're going to have a great outcome. Now, we do have fancier lenses. And it really comes down to, well, how much, do you, how much spectacle independence do you want? Uh, we have what we call our driving package, which is precision distance vision. So 
We'll correct your distance vision. We'll also correct any astigmatism that you may have. We make sure to use that Aura device that measures your prescription in real time to help us really fine tune that prescription and make sure we've got you dialed in uh, by the time that you leave. And so the expectations with that are that you don't need glasses for distance vision. Now, computer, reading, things like that, you have to put on a pair of, pair of reading glasses. You know, really, you could go to Drug Mart and get a pair of reading glasses to use for that. And so this is great for, we have a lot of people who golf a lot or like to go hiking or they drive truck for a living. They can't have one eye for far, one eye for up close, like a mono vision. And they don't want, uh, they don't want anything disturbing, you know, seeing like a hawk down the road. And the driving package is fantastic for those people. We also have some, this sounds like it's from the future, but it's called the light adjustable lens. And it's made out of something called photoreactive silicone. And so you put the lens into the eye, you wear UV glasses for the first month after the surgery. We can actually change your prescription while it's in your eye using this light delivery device. And so say you end up a little more nearsighted than we anticipated based on all of our measurements, or you've got a little bit of astigmatism left over. We can actually fix that while it's in your eye. The light delivery device changes the shape of that lens to fine tune your prescription. Um, and so we actually use it, we were part of the original studies for this lens, and we were part of uh, a study more recently, I think it was 2018, because we talked about LASIK patients, they're harder to predict the lens that we put in. And so we found with this, we can get more accurate results for that LASIK patient if we use this lens uh, compared to our traditional lenses. And that was the study uh, that we were involved in more recently. Hmm. Yeah. What exactly is astigmatism? So astigmatism, everyone says the old, your eyes shaped like a football, not like a basketball. So astigmatism means that instead of the front surface of your eye being perfectly spherical, where you need one power in your glasses, it's a little steeper going one way, a little flatter going the other way. And so you need different powers in your glasses in different directions. When it's not focused, you know, if you have uncorrected astigmatism, you have a couple different focal points in your eyes and it just creates something called a blur circle where everything's just a little fuzzy. Most of us have some amount of astigmatism. Astigmatism sounds like a terrible disease because it has the word stigma in it, but it's just a glass, it's a refractive error, it's a glasses prescription. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> the natural lens is elastic to some extent, but the... Uh... And you lose it over time though. That's why we end up getting bifocals or we end up needing reading glasses as time goes on. You start to form these bonds inside of that lens. So to focus up close, a muscle contracts and the elastic lens gets thicker and you can focus up close. As we get into our 40s and 50s and 60s, that muscle still works fine, but just like the rest of us, it's not as flexible as it once was. And that brings up an interesting point though. There actually, there's drops in phase three studies that break those, help to break those bonds that were making the lens stiffer and help to give you some of that reading back. Uh, and it's been pretty promising at this point in time. It's not available yet. Again, it's in phase three studies, but that's something to watch out for uh, moving forward. They're working on these drops to help fix presbyopia where you need reading glasses in the future. Yeah. If a person's already had cataract surgery, mm -hmm. is it possible to go back in and remediate with one of the newer lenses? Also an interesting question. Uh, a lens exchange at this point in time is general, unless you're having big issues, is generally a little more invasive than we'd like to be. You know, the juice isn't worth the squeeze. Um, if you did have leftover 
you know, prescription that you wanted to get rid of, oftentimes we can do LASIK over the top of that uh, instead of going back in and changing the lenses. But talking more about the future, which doesn't help you if you've already had cataract surgery, uh, there's something called a refractive capsule uh, that one of our friends, not here, not in Ohio, but they're working on. It's called a refractive capsule and basically you put the lens in this capsule in the same place that you would put the lens for cataract surgery and you put the lens inside of that capsule. And then in the future, if a new lens technology comes out, you can take that lens out and put the new lens in. It's like upgrading your iPhone. And so I think we'll see a time at some point in the future where having cataract surgery is you know, like going in to get your new phone basically. You just go get the upgrade and then you know, say 10 years from now a new lens comes out and you say, boy that looks great. I wish I had those features. You could go in there and have that, that lens put in. We're not there yet, but that's something that's on the horizon actually. Does your practice do anything with Procara? The Procara, so the amniotic membrane lenses, we do work with amniotic membranes, which is cool if you've never heard of that. Um, these amniotic membranes, we actually get them from the tissue from the mother at the time of birth, and they're either cryopreserved or freeze, or they're dried, they're dehydrated, and they, cr they contain a lot of anti-inflammatory growth factors, healing factors, and we use these for certain conditions on the eye, um, where defects aren't healing up, or you have a bad infection and you need these growth factors. And you can actually put this amniotic membrane on the surface of the eye and it gets absorbed into the tissue. And then if it's the Procare, it's held on a ring and the ring is just removed after about a week. Uh, they've used these amniotic membranes in different types of medicine for a long time, but it's newer for the eyes. Uh, they use them on burn victims, they've used them on uh, children or infants with spina bifida and it actually helps to heal you know, that spinal column. So those are, that's neat technology. Yeah. Did you have a question? Yeah, I'll ask you at the end of the lecture. All right. Let's see. So multifocal lenses. This is where I think over the past year we've made real big strides with these multifocal lenses. Uh, we actually have a lens now that's a trifocal. It allows you to see far, near, intermediate, and it kind of blends all those together. And in our clinic it's provided people a wide range of you know, vision from driving to their computer to reading up close. Uh, there are also lenses that, so the way these work is by splitting the light. And so you might hear people say, well, it causes glare, halos. With this lens in particular that we're working with, sometimes you do see a little annulus of light around headlights. Uh, but it's not been anything that's stopped or you know, even had a significant impact on our patients driving at night, anything like that. It's been really a fantastic lens for us. Uh, we actually, there are lenses now that don't even split the light. You don't get as much reading, but you have none of that glare, halos, anything like that. And so these lenses are really individualized for you. We take, you know, what your hobbies are, the health of your eyes, the structure of your eyes, your glasses prescription, any other eye conditions that you may have, and we can customize a lens you know, specifically for you moving forward. And so there are a lot, a lot of options out there. And our job is not to try to get you into the priciest lens. Our job is to get you into the lens that suits your lifestyle and suits your eyes the best as possible. You know, if you have certain conditions, say you have macular degeneration or glaucoma, well, certain lenses won't be right for you. You know, you, we don't like to use multifocal lenses if you've got other eye conditions going on in most cases. And so these are all parts of the, 
you know, the preoperative screening that we check you from top to bottom. You know, why are they checking my dry eyes or why are they checking the back of my eyes before I have cataract surgery? And the reason is it all plays into the same system. We're trying to get you into the best lens for you. We actually do something called same day surgery now. It's something that's really, I think some good things have come from the pandemic, quite frankly. We've learned how to be a little more efficient. We don't want you, you know, when we had this going on, we could hardly get people you know, in for surgery. There were people we couldn't get in. We had to figure out ways to really streamline that. Does it mean that we're you know, decreasing your care? No, but we're getting you in on the same day taking all of your measurements, going over everything that's involved with the surgery. We did talk to you prior to that, but we do the surgery on the same day that you come in for all of those measurements. And fortunately, because we do a lot of cataract surgeries, we don't have to order lenses for every single patient. We've got them all in stock back here. And so, you know, whatever we come up with would be your best plan. We'll have the lens for you and able to do the surgery the same day. So why Cleveland Eye? Well, we got this fancy new building. We need someone to come break it in for us. <laughs> now, I mean, really, uh, this is what we do. And this is what we've done since well, the 40s. Yeah. What would be the consequence or what whatever if you decided not to have cataract surgery, even though you had have cataract? Also a good question. You know, people think, so there are certain conditions where if you had a retinal tear and you go, well, I don't want to do anything about it. We say, no, 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 you have to do something. You're going to go blind if you don't do something about it. Cataracts in most cases, you can wait. If you say, yeah, I know my vision's not as clear as it was previously, but it's not affecting me all that much. I'm still happy with my vision. I'll say, okay, we'll, we'll see you again in a year. Or if it starts to affect you, where you say I'm not, I'm not able to read the way I did before, or, you know, I'm not able to drive at night, okay, we'll take it out sooner. But leaving it in the eye is not something that's going to physically hurt your eye in most cases. Now, if you said I never want cataract surgery, what would happen? Well, you can actually go blind from not having cataract surgery. It's a reversible br blindness because we can take out that lens. But cataracts are actually the leading, leading cause of reversible blindness in the world. You know, here we're able, everyone can get cataract surgery, you know, we, we think. Uh, in third world countries, you go blind from cataracts. Um, and so, left untreated forever and ever, you'll lose your vision from it. But it's reversible. Now, I have some drops that I use with, uh, that I have glaucoma. Now, does that ever go away, glaucoma? When they you know, I'm glad you brought, these are great questions. I didn't plant him. <laughs> <laughs> so we actually do procedures at the time of cataract surgery called MIGS procedures, minimally invasive or microincisional glaucoma surgery. And these are actually procedures done during the time of cataract surgery. Most are only approved to, to be done during cataract surgery, but they lower your eye pressure. And so they can if not eliminate the drops that you take, if you take more than one drop for glaucoma, it can often decrease the amount of drops that you need to take. Not only that, it's been shown it doesn't increase the risk of the cataract surgery by having this additional procedure done at the time of the cataract surgery. They're really cool little devices. Some of them help to decrease the fluid that's uh, made inside of the eye for the pressure. Most of them increase the amount of fluid that drains out, so it lowers your eye pressure at the same time. And uh, the devices are you know, teeny tiny. There's one that we use that's the size of Lincoln's nose on the penny. And so it's the smallest device that's implanted in the body. So can you get... Do you use Amit, Amit glycoma wall, Ahmad? Oh, the, the tube shunt? That's a more invasive procedure. Yeah, and he's so, a good friend of mine. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. We have a glaucoma uh, specialist, Dr. Cosmetis, who does the Ahmed shunt. Yeah. And so that's, 
That's for someone who they've had m the more traditional yeah. glaucoma procedures. In third world countries, it's very common, and that's what he invented that device. You know what? Because when you do that, you don't come back and say, "Well, is it still working for me, or do I need it?" I mean, that's the that's the ultimate. I'll get your pressure. Normal pressure is about 10 to 20. It can usually lower you to you know the high single digits or the you know, low teens at most. Yeah, interesting. So we do work with that. It's not done during cataract surgery in most cases yeah. for us. Yeah. Let me ask you a question, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm a radiological physicist. Uh-huh. Um, when you put the new lens, uh -huh. what holds the lens? What holds the lens? The capsule is holding the lens in place. Okay, now let's suppose you have a play of one millimeter. Yes. That means you are out of focus, out of sight. That does mean you're out of focus. And so that's kind of the last and frontier. You're putting the lens, you have so many variables, mm -hmm. multidimensional variables, you know, front. and any one number is off. A third of a millimeter leads to about a one diopter, so one unit, you know, shift in your refractive error. What you're talking about is effective lens position. Yeah. Uh, and it varies from person to person. Our measurements that we take now with the IOL master are more precise than they were previously, but based on that effective lens position, there's always the possibility for that refractive surprise that you get. And so with what happens if you get a refractive surprise? Well, sometimes you can wear glasses. That's an option. Other options though, we can actually do a lens exchange. So we can go in there and exchange the lens. We talked about doing that before. Um, if it's early in the surgical process, it's usually easier to do than if it's been you know, years. So you can do a lens exchange. You can do a piggyback lens where you put another lens on top of the one in there to compensate for that error. Or you can do LASIK on the front surface of the eye. And so all of those things can help to correct for that refractive surprise that you get from that effective lens position. The other option is if we put that light adjustable lens in your eye, well then we can just change it while the lens is in there. And so if you end up a little farsighted or a little bit of astigmatism that we didn't expect, we can use that light delivery device to change that lens power while it's in your eye. So it's like a knee surgery that you can replace the knee many times. Ideally not. Uh, we try to be as least invasive as possible, but yeah. usually your refractive error is pretty much set by the one month point. So you have only one shot. Um, That's what scares me most. The, the one shot. Yes. But again, we can do something like uh, in the event that you needed it. Mm -hmm. We do something like the piggyback lens. Or we could do a LASIK procedure over the top. Or if you said, well, I don't want a second procedure, you just do the light adjustable lens mm -hmm. and we're able to change the power while it's in your eye. So you did get the one shot. We aimed the best we could for distance. But if there's any adjustments we need to make, we do it after the surgery while the lens is in your eye, just using UV light in that photoreactive silicone. Okay, let's a person has a vascular leakage. Uh huh. How would you tackle both situations at the same time? Meaning they have leakage in the veins. In the so say they have like a, a, a vein occlusion where yeah. they're, oftentimes we want that retina to be under control before we do uh, the Is cataract procedure. You can char char characterize the veins? During that time, you know, with that, we still use lasers in the back of the eye. These are our retina, retina doctors. A lot of times if the leakage is towards the center part of the vision, we don't like to use lasers because it destroys the tissue. And they're actually using um, medications injected into the eye that were derived from cancer medications. They're called anti-vascular endothelial growth factor. Mm -hmm. And that can stop the leakage as well. As far as that's concerned, 
it kind of goes back to your question. We want to address the problem that can cause permanent damage to your eye unless it's immediately addressed. So we address that vascular leakage first and then once we get clear, clearance for the cataract surgery, we'll do that. And so it's, it's multi-step. See, I don't have very good experience with the ophthalmologist. Uh-huh. You know. And because I went to Cleveland Clinic and Dr. Venkat, you know, God knows where she got the degree from. <laughs> Bleep that out. <laughs> oh. yeah. and, that, the, and she did nothing, just uh, keep uh, scanning me over and over again. Uh -huh. Six or eight times. Then I went to Dr. Miller. Mm -hmm. He said, I have... Mm, diabetic edema, mm -hmm. I looked at it, Dr. Stern and my optometrist looked at it, yeah. there's no edema. Hmm. And he said the whole course will take three years. Gosh, you know, I wish... Has that ever been settled? No, because all three doctors speak with three mouths. Uh -huh. Yeah. And I went to Dr. Stephens and he said, hey, come tomorrow and we'll do the surgery. <laughs> And so you don't know what to do. Yeah, yeah that's reasonable. It, so, Dr. Sterner, we know. Um, He's a very good guy. Yeah. He's a very good guy. Dr. He's Miller, we know. Great oh, guy, too. No. no. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> we like Dr. Miller. <laughs> so. I know. It's, it's tough. I've had situations before where... Um, and I, I understand your, your frustration entirely. They said, well, I want you to say the same thing that this doctor said, and I want that doctor to say the same thing that doctor said. And like you said, it's three different people looking at, you know, looking at an eye condition, and oftentimes it's hard to come up with a consensus this with this. It would take three years. <laughs> I treat cancer patients, you know, and it took them five weeks, it would be done. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know the situation, but I, and that's a that's tough. I understand that, that it's frustrating, and so. So that's my problem. That you know, it's a one shot surgery. Mm -hmm. If it's not, you're done. I don't think that's the case, though. Most of the people, you know, I have known cases where you know their good eye did the surgery and the good eye. So good eye becomes bad eye, and bad eye become good eye. Well, that's true. You know, we'll have people in who have a very dense cataract in one eye and a moderate cataract in the other. We take the dense cataract out. And yeah, they, say, they did the surgery on the good eye, and so the bad eye becomes good eye, and good eye becomes bad eye. So, I guess what you're saying is, is there a possibility of complications with yeah, cataract surgery? Yeah, well, with Absolutely. Basically, sources of errors, I would like to know. So, any surgical procedure comes with inherent risks, right? Yes. And so, your risk, uh, what are the risks? You know, there's a risk of retinal detachment. There's a risk of infection during surgery. There's a risk of edema in the Simple back. Simple risk of, is yes. the movement of the lens by itself, you know, about a millimeter and you're out of focus. So we're talking about refractive error. Yeah. Yeah, and we talked about the ways that we could address that afterwards. So. Do we absolutely know with 100% certainty what the absolute outcome is going to be? No. And if your surgeon tells you that it's 100%, 100% of the time, I would probably get a second opinion. But it's safer than it's ever been. If there are complications, which are usually, you know, as far as serious complications, infection, retinal detachments, less than 1%. Uh, but we watch you carefully in the post-operative period, and if something like that was to come up, we address it as rapidly as possible. Again, is it a one-time deal, putting the lens in? Most times, yeah. But if there is residual refractive error, or if there are any other complications, we do what we can to, you know, to fix that for you. But again, surgery, I mean, getting in your car and coming here, there's inherent risks. And so, we, we do our best we can to mitigate those risks and address them if they come up. Yeah. Question. Um, 
you have your surgery. So what happens the rest of the day? Then? You know, in other words, uh huh. Like you need someone to drive you home. Or, yes. And uh, from there, what, what happens after? The drive you home. You got a shield on your eyes. We tell you to sit in a chair and take it easy. Okay. Um, day one after the surgery, it's still pretty light. I mean, you're up and walking around. Um, but we don't want you to do any heavy lifting or anything too strenuous. Can you drive day after? Most people are okay driving day after. Now, if you have one eye done and the other eye is not, or if you have some swelling after the surgery, which is common day one, it's probably best to just have someone else drive you until you make sure you're comfortable. I usually tell people, make sure you're comfortable in the passenger seat before you get behind the wheel. And so, um, I would say day one, most people have someone drive them in. Week one, most people drive themselves in. The drive is being covered the whole time. It's a clear shield, and you only have to wear, you wear it day one, you know, the day of the surgery, and you wear it at night for the first week after the surgery. You don't have to wear it during the day. We trust you not to rub your eye during the day. Yeah, yeah. And we don't trust you overnight. <laughs> now, what causes a um, hemorrhage in the eye? from cataract surgery. Is that caused by the stent that's put in or, you know? So hemorrhage inside, like bleeding inside of the eye? Well, in the back of the eye or whatever that I had to go to a retina specialist and do it all over. So, remind me what you had to have done. I had the surgery over yeah. in Elyria, I mean in Brexville. Uh-huh. And then I didn't, I couldn't see anything for Nine days, you white. you had the shunt put in, right? Okay. Right, and so right, and so rarely what what happens is the shunt goes into the drainage channels, and those drainage channels are hooked up to a vascular system, and in most people you can get what's called a microhyphema. He had the glaucoma procedure at the time of this. So you get a little bleeding and it's actually a good sign that that drainage channel is hooked up or the shunt is hooked up to the whole drainage system. When it's, if it's rare, it's not rare if it happens to you, but while it's rare <laughs> and you get the big hyphema, well then you're trying to look through blood and that doesn't work and so the retinal surgeon had to flush that out. Yeah, exactly. In the back of my eye. I would say it's very, very uncommon, but we have a saying it's not rare if it's in your chair, or it's not rare if, if it's you. And then I was afraid to have the other eye done because I thought the doctor would go on break when he saw my name. <laughs> yeah. I thought maybe I'd get another one, but they, so he didn't put one in that eye. He thought maybe that caused the hemorrhage. I don't know. In, in most cases, Yes, that would be what would cause the hemorrhage because hemorrhaging during, you know, cataract surgery is, you know, uncommon. It's avascular tissue that we're, we're working through the cornea, which is avascular, and the lens, which is avascular. But during that MIGS procedure, we're getting into something that's more vascularized where you can get the bleeding. What about the capsule? Uh, the capsule is vascularized? No. The capsule is not vascularized. The capsule protects that lens from your body's immune system. Um, sometimes people talk about getting a second cataract surgery after you had the cataract. And it's actually the capsule, the back surface, that becomes opacified. And we just use a little laser in the office to clean that up. That's a one-time deal. And so you don't, you, the cataract surgery, the lens lasts as long as you do. Um, but sometimes you have to, or often you have to get a laser at some point after the cataract surgery to clean up that capsule. Now when you were a, a fetus, there was a blood vessel that went to that lens there. But that dissolves before you're born. Yes? Around since 1943. Yes. Okay. I started a couple years after that. <laughs> um, that gives you a lot of data. Uh huh. What is your practices percentage of routine cataract surgery that has left the patient permanently worse off than when they started? 
permanent loss of vision? Well, if we went back to 1943, those numbers would be a lot higher than they are right now, just based on the instrumentation and things like that uh, that we use. As far as permanent vision loss, you know, be it from a retinal tear, infection in the eye, worse than when they started, I can't give you the exact percentage, but it is less than 1%. So, as far as an exact percentage, I don't, I don't know that I could give you that a precise answer to that, but I'll look into it. Is there a risk of retinal detachment? There is, and so the risk is higher. Or, te or tear, I mean. Sure. Yeah, one can lead to the other. A tear can lead to a detachment. Okay, because my vitreous detachment, I've already had. Right, and so your risk is lower. The risk. It, the risk is higher of having a retinal detachment from cataract surgery if that vitreous gel hasn't already separated. Since yours is separated, there's really nothing in the back of the eye that would be tugging on that tissue. So younger patients, when they have cataract surgery, higher nearsightedness, males, uh, all have higher risk for retinal detachments during the procedure. But again, it's less than a percentage, less than 1%. And it's something that we watch for after the procedure. Oftentimes you'll say, well, why the heck are you dilating me at all these appointments after the procedure? One's to look at the lens, but the other's to look and make sure there's no retinal changes that you have going on. Flashes of light floaters. I always tell people, if you want to get in immediately, call and say you have flashes and floaters and won't tell you to come right in. <laughs> so how many follow-up visits are there after? So, for if we say you're having one eye done and then the other eye done two weeks later, it works out like this. You, after the first eye, you have a one day, then a one week. After the second eye, you have a one day, then a one week, and then a month after that. So when they come back from the exams on the second eye, they're also looking at the first eye. Too. Absolutely, so. yeah. So what happens if you're not seeing too well after you have your first cataract done. Do you, do you wait longer than that two-week period? That's what we like to do. Um, we like to make sure you're completely locked in with your first eye before we address the second eye. And so it's not common, but that happens where we say, you know what, there's still some swelling there. or boy, you're not quite healed up the way we thought you would. There's, you know, you've got the inflammation in your eyes. We'll push off that second surgery until you and we are completely satisfied with that first procedure. Also, uh, for people who have macular degeneration, mm -hmm. are there products that you have here to help them? So, I don't... There are people who practice what's called low vision, and it's for macular degeneration or just more conditions where glasses don't get the job done for you. And we don't have anyone in our practice that does that, but I do work closely. Uh, a colleague of mine, Dr. Weitzel, um, she's over, uh, she's a low vision specialist and she has a room full of different lights and magnifiers and video devices and things like that. And oftentimes I'll send patients her way where there's no treatment available, you know, that would make no, no medical treatment, no surgical treatment, no glasses that would make them better. And they've got options. Um, but macular degeneration's a tough one. We, we like problems where we can fix it and be done with it. But macular degeneration is, a lot of research is ongoing with that. And so strides are being made slowly, slowly but surely, yeah. Any other questions? Well, thanks for coming out. I hope everyone grabbed some food, right? There's a lot of food there. <laughs>
we were going to have Renata go over pricing for our cataract packages and talk about next steps so that you can get back to seeing people. A absolutely. <laughs> Renato's much more charming than I am. Hey, how about the hand for Dr. Rose? Thank you, Thank you guys. We took the time off to come here and talk to you. So All right. You so. I appreciate it. Thank you. Good seeing you. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, you, you don't have my slide? This one? All right, I think this is still live, so. Well, first of all, I think Michelle touched the base on this one regarding it, what many locations we have. Okay. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but it's important to you that you're close to this location. So, but all the locations are listed pretty much on your pamphlet in your um, uh, folder. Um, I want you to know that we have two surgery centers. This is the second one we just built last year, like Dr. Roseman said. But in Brexville, our main campus was built 15 years ago. And when the doctor talked about the laser, the aura, well, I want you to know also that until recently, we were the only one in Northeast of Ohio that had that laser. So the one thing that I want to tell you that our surgeons are, they have a philosophy about their practice, just like you and I have a philosophy about our life. They believe in education of the patients and they being on cutting edge technology. As you probably already noticed, I am a cataract patient educator, that's why we do seminars. And we try to also, for patients that schedule an appointment with our surgeons, they get a packet of information, just like the one that you got here today, with the more details, obviously, about your upcoming cataract evaluation with one of our surgeons. So there's zillions of forms there and all that stuff. So basically you get an education at home. So you don't have to waste time when you come into the office to do all the forms. That's one, one thing. The other thing is there's an opportunity to talk to me prior to coming to see the surgeons based on the literature you got. If you have any questions, just like you did with Dr. Roseman. So if you have questions, stuff like that, I can entertain that before you come to see the surgeon. And you know, you can do it like a Zoom meeting, you can do over the phone, whatever applies. And if you feel more comfortable, there is always a patient educator in clinic with the surgeon as well. So you can have a further education there. And then we do the seminars. The reason of the seminar is to educate the community, just like you. You know, this is a new center, so we try to educate the patients that we exist, but also that we have choices when we talk about cataract surgery. You know, I want you to know that two-thirds of the surgeons do not offer choices. So we're part of the elite one-third, and you, the patients, benefit from that. So that's the reason why Dr. Roseman went and explained about the choices that you have, the type of surgeries. So I'm going to kind of extend that. These are the surgeons, by the way. Uh, Dr. Pierre, you mentioned about Dr. Pierre, one in the middle. But anyway, so what I want to talk about is just a little briefly summarize what the doctor just went over with you. So I'm going to bring the slide that talks about, I don't know if you can see from there, especially if you have a cataract, you probably don't. <laughs> so, so I don't know how we can expand this, but I want you to know, and I cannot even use the pointer because on the TV it usually doesn't show. Anyway, so there are four choices when you talk about cataract surgery. And based on the question that I heard, some of you guys, if not most of you guys, already had a surgery, looks like. Raise hands. Okay, I take it back, it's only two. <laughs> but I want you to know is that the four choices, they are listed and they are uh, type of su surgeries that based on the, your lifestyle. So when the doctor mentioned that you have a basic surgery, basic surgery is a, a traditional surgery. If, uh, you know, I know you're, you're old enough, but if you think about your mom and dad, if they had a cataract in the past and they end up to have surgery, what do you think they did? Basic surgery, right? There was no lasers then. There was no technology that we have today. You know, doctor mentioned about light adjustable lens. I want you to know about light, light adjustable lens that our doctor, Dr. Wiley, was the, was the doctor that did the first surgery about light adjustable lens in all the United States. So that speaks a lot of volume about our practice and the surgeons. You know, that's the reason why I mentioned about the education. But when we talk about technology, doctor already went through that, and I'm going to say some more while I go on. So the basic, surg the basic surgery, which is your first column there, 
like I mentioned, it's traditional. That means the doctor doesn't have no technology that plays any role for him except when they do the examination, the evaluation prior to you coming to do the surgery. So based on that evaluation, he's going to pick and choose a couple of lenses, you order them, and then when he does the surgery, based on what he sees, he'll pick one of the lens. But the disadvantage to that is that patients, they go with the basic surgery. Going in, more likely they have what? Bifocals, right? They have bifocals, trifocals even. So more, more likely, 80, 85% of the patients, they go in with the basic surgery and they have bifocals. After the basic surgery, more likely they're dependent on bifocals again. And the reason is simple. Like a doctor mentioned earlier, Dr. Roseman, they correct basically the distance vision. So they remove the cataract with ultrasound energy, and then the doctor will put the lens in. And that lens is a standard lens. It will give you a good distance vision. But for reading, you need a pair of glasses. He also mentioned about the astigmatism level. Right? We all have it, some minor, some maybe more excessive. But that part of the condition of the eye is not corrected with the basic surgery. Therefore, you need what? To clarify the vision a little bit, you need a pair of glasses. That's the reason why you need bifocals, more likely even after the surgery. Now, the prescription, like the doctor mentioned, the prescription changed, right? So if they put the lens in, it does something. It corrected some kind of vision. So the difference is corrected with the glasses. The good news is that the insurance pays for it. Yeah, I'm not talking about just Medicare. Any insurances follow the same footstep of Medicare. So therefore, they pay for most of the surgery except your deductibles and copay. Now, if you're on Medicare, you have, let's say, Plan F, Plan G, those kind of plans. You know, you're prepaying with a premium every month more. So therefore, you don't have deductibles and copay. Those are exceptional plans where you pay nothing except the drops. You know, the doctor mentioned about the formulation that our doctors came up with the pharmacist about, what, I don't know, two, two and a half years ago, maybe three, where they compounded the three medications that traditionally were used in one. So now you have to put only one drop for the whole day versus like three drops four times a day for a month. So this, the $65 is for toward the drops. But otherwise, you have only the deductibles and copay. So the vision is good. There's nothing wrong with a basic surgery. It's an excellent surgery. But you have to be dependent on those glasses. Then you have a patient that say, hey, you know, this is my only opportunity. I think you mentioned that there's one-time surgery, right? Well, it is one-time surgery because these lenses are durable. They last about 100 years, maybe even 150. Who knows? You think it's long enough? <laughs> and I see some faces of, you know, one guy told me, as soon as I said 100, the first thing he said, he didn't let me finish. He said, hey, are you saying I have to have another surgery? <laughs> he said, he's way out there, right? <laughs> I said, you wish. But the point I'm trying to make is, because the lens is so durable, it is a one-time surgery. So that's the reason why it's important to understand what this, th these choices gives you. I mean, all four of them do what? Okay, does the Medicare cover IOL lenses? The standard does. Not the IOL. No, they are, well, they're all, they're all, they are all IOL. But one is a standard and the other one more sophisticated. So when you talk about the basic surgery, they use the standard lens, and Medicare does pay for that. When we talk about the other three, we talk about the technology. So as having said that, just like the doctor said, it becomes more something that fits your lifestyle, it's something it's like an elective. Okay. So being an elective then it's just like LASIK. Who had LASIK here? So it's the same thing. So when you do LASIK, yeah, I mean, so few. How much it cost <laughs> for, for eye? Well, we'll go through each one of them individuals because each one has different prices depending on what the lens does. So like I mentioned earlier, they all four, four will remove the cataract, which is the problem, right? But the way the vision is corrected is different. So that depends, again, on the lifestyle. So when we talk about the driving package that Dr. Rosamond mentioned, Dr. That, that kind of package is more for people, let's say, any golfers here? We have a couple of them, three. That's the majority. <laughs> no, what I'm trying to say is that if you're a golfer, if you're a pilot, a truck driver, Dr. Rosamond mentioned that, so more likely you want to see the ball leaving, tracking, and landing. 
Right? If it's a golfer, that's what they want to do. You know, they're tired to ask the body to tell them where the ball went. You hit it right. Yeah. <laughs> if you hit it, the tree will still go in, you know. So the point I'm going to try to make is that, you know, you want to want to be dependent. You want to be, you want to see the, able to be, see the ball landing on the green. So that means both eyes have to focus at the finest point, right? So having said that, the driving package will give you that. A truck driver, the same thing, especially with driving at night, they want to see that finest point. So bottom line is, both eyes will be done for distance, so from arm length out, more, you don't need the glasses, because the lens is a toric lens, that will correct the near or far vision corrections, but the advantage is that they can correct also the astigmatism that the doctor explained. You know, you mentioned about basketball versus football, so the more you got toward the football, the worse it is, right? So that is corrected with all three surgeries. That's the reason why you only have no fuzziness at distance, and therefore no glasses. So both eyes from arm length down. So let me explain it, kind of put it in, a, you know, in perspective. If you had to the computer desktop, you know, computer level, more likely you can get by with no glasses. But definitely, you don't need the glasses when you're watching TV, you're driving, you're golfing. If you're a pilot, you can plane, you know, land that plane pretty nicely. So what do you do for reading then? Cheaters. Yeah, exactly. Cheaters is good. You know, most of the people can go to the drugstore with a, you know, maybe $10 to buy five pairs. You put one in the kitchen, one in the car. You, know, you don't have to take them with you. You just reach out, you know, take with you whenever you, wherever you go. So insurance does cover some. I don't want you to think the insurance just puts you dry, you know. We always submit to the insurance the basic cost of the surgery, regardless what you pick. So by doing so, they pay for the doctor's time, the removal of the cataract, you know, stuff like that. When you talk about the lens itself, the toric lens I mentioned for the driving package, the lasers that the doctor uh, you know, explained about the, the aura. The aura is the type of device that during the surgery, real time, after the cataract has been removed, there is no abstraction to the light anymore. The laser will look at the shape of the eye, the length and the curvature to determine the power of the lens that will go inside the eye. So that's the precision that you get only real time during the surgery. And sometimes the doctor, they order the lenses prior you coming in based on the evaluation. But let's assume that, that the lens that they purchased for you is not the correct one because the laser picked something else. Well, we have over 3,000 lenses in consignments. You don't have to worry about it. You're going to go walk out, out, walk out of there with a good <laughs> vision. So the, the stigmatism is corrected and that the insurance doesn't care for it. The lens, which is toric, which is a more sophisticated lens than the standard, is not covered. And so then what happens with the, the toric lens, you can do a couple of things, really. One is to correct the vision. The other thing is to correct the astigmatism as well. More, the more the astigmatism is severe, the more likely the doctor uses the lens to correct the astigmatism. And when that occurs, the laser that takes the measurements of the eye also will help the doctor to rotate the lens to the proper angle to correct the astigmatism. Now you understand the functionality of the technology, right? So when you talk about driving package, you're left with cheaters, but everything else, you don't need the glasses. The insurance cover, again, the basic cost. You're still responsible for deductibles and copay. But there is an additional cost, which the insurance doesn't care for the astigmatism, for the lens, and for the laser, which is 2,500 per eye. Now, the drops are included part of the laser package. Now, some patients say, okay, I want no glasses, period. Is it? I had a gentleman, I'm going to give you a quick story here. Uh, he was about 84 years old. You, you probably, because you know, some people, they say, yeah, at my age, you know, what do I need this? That's the wrong answer, I'm telling you right now. So the, the, land, the answer is, what helps me to gain quality vision for the rest of my life? You know, you don't know what God gives you, so enjoy whatever is left, right? So having said that, he said, Renato, I got your packet, I read it, I understand everything. So you don't need to talk to me about that. He said, you just killed my job. He said, what do you want to talk about that? He said, let me tell you what I do every day that I enjoy doing it. I read 50 to 100 books a year. So he reads what, a book or two a, a week. He said, the other thing I do, I go to the club and play cards with my buddies just about every day. 
Say, I don't want no more glasses. I understand these glasses, they last my lifetime. This is my time. He was 84 years old. And when you talk about cost, see, he was not driven by the cost, he was driven by the functionality of his vision, what it's supposed to be for the rest of his life. He had so severe astigmatism that, because there were some questions asked before, that the lens as well as the laser, whatever we had at that time, we're talking about four or five years ago, it did not correct the whole astigmatism. So it defeats the purpose of having a multifocal lens, right? I mean, that the, the reason why the multifocal lens is not to have any glasses, and now he's still stuck with the glasses for clarity. So he had to do what the doctor suggested earlier about LASIK surgery after that, which was an additional cost as well. But there is always a solution, believe it or not. You know. So when, when the patients say, I don't want no more glasses, there's two options there. there. There are two options. One is the personalized vision, which is the light adjustable lens that the doctor mentioned that we were part of the studies, and Dr. Wild did the first surgery in all the United States. And then the other one is the multifocal. So what's the difference between the two? When you talk about the personalized vision, which is light adjustable lens, that's the lens that doctor mentioned that they can fine tune while the lens is inside the eye with the device, the light adjustable lens device that they, the light treatments basically. And you can do two, three, four, depending on what the surgeon wants to do or thinks is best. And the intent of that is to give you the quality vision. Generally speaking, when you talk about the result, you know, people that go with light adjustable lens, they get around 2020. Exceptionally few got better than 2020. So they got even 2018, 2015 even. I'm not saying everyone is going to get that. No, there's no such a thing. But there is always a potential. So it depends on the eye. On the eye. We're all unique when you talk about the eyes. So it depends on the eye shape, length, and curvature. You can get the, those results or may not. But, but what's, what's wrong with 2020? Anybody complain about 2020? <laughs> Kind of, you know, it is, I don't know think you'd say it's 2020, it's around 2020, it's close enough. So the personalized vision will do what we call a monovision. You know, one eye for reading, one eye for distance, right? So that's the target. That lens it requires a little work, like I said, because you gotta do a fine tuning. So it's a lot of more work from the surgeons, you know, and you also, because every time you come to do those sessions, you, you basically have to spend just the same time that you do when you do the cataract evaluation. You know, the same amount of time, and they, they do the, you know, the treatment, but you got to protect what the doctor does, because when they do the treatment, they use ultraviolet light. You know, if you go outside, not today, but if you go outside and it's a bright sunny day, you know, and the sun has ultraviolet light, you know, it'll modify what the doctor did, so you got to protect that. So they give you a nice, stylish pair of glasses for outdoor and one for the indoor, and you wear them pretty much all day except when you sleep. So that's the work you have to do, but the results are phenomenal, so therefore that's the reason why people go with this type of uh, uh, choice. Now, the one that benefit the most from that would be probably people like me, they had LASIK, and monovision, the brain is already figured out how to use the eyes, you know, the neurological adaption is there. So that's, for me, it's easy transition, but it doesn't mean that nobody else can do it. You know, if, you, if you, uh, the brain is adapt, uh, you know, adapting to the situation, They'll read the eyes and everything, so you'll be fine. But that's the target. It's a monovision. The, uh, the insurance, again, covers the basic cost, which is the doctor's time, you know, the, uh, the, the removal of the cataract and so forth. But the astigmatism corrections, is not, you know, no, they don't pay for that. The sophisticated lens, which is the light adjustable lens, obviously they don't pay for that. And the laser itself. So for this, this type of choice, the cost is going to be 3900 per eye, in addition to your deductibles and copay. But when we talk about the multifocal, the doctor mentioned is basically taking care of all these dis distances. You know, generally they use a trifocal lens, which basically will give you reading, with computer distance, and distance. You know, the, when you, the intermediate distance, that's what I meant. So as a lens that is exceptionally in, in the, when you talk about the advancements of the technology, it's a tri, like the trifocal glasses that you have. It's, a, it's the same three, three points of corrections. So this is the same thing applies here. They use the aura, they 
corrected the, the, the vision with the multifocal lens, but the insurance doesn't pay for all that, nor for the corrections of the astigmatism. These lenses, all of them, are capable of correcting the astigmatism to a degree with the lens itself. So the doctor is mixing choices depending on what he sees during the surgery. The ultimate goal is to give you the quality vision that you know, you're expecting, not expecting it, but can give you the better outcome for the vision corrections so you can do your daily tasks just like you used to do before. In this case, for option personalized and multifocal with no glasses. Now I want you to know also when we talk about money that our doctors are pretty good about understanding that you know, it's a lot of money. So what they do, they offer financing. We don't do ourselves, obviously, but we have a company that you know, will help you to achieve that. The financing is a 0% for 24 months, basically no interest. So you, instead of paying all at once, you have a 24 months to pay for it. Whatever the amount is going to be, you divide by 24 and no interest. So that's pretty much what you get. Any questions about, I try to be brief, quick, <laughs> to summarize, yes. How much did you say for the multifocal? It's 3,900 per eye, both of them. The, both of them are the, the personalized or the multifocal doesn't matter. They, they are achieving the same thing. It's just a, it's a monovision versus a multifocal, that's all. And you were saying with the light adjustable that you would still have to wear like sunglasses? And that kind well, of the, the sunglasses only to protect while the doctor is doing the light treatments. And the reason of that is because if you go outside and it's a bright sunny day, it can modify what the doctor did. Right. So in order to preserve that, they give you these sunglasses. So you, don't have, you have to wear them until, it's one thing the doctor maybe didn't mention, and I didn't mention either, but I'm going to tell you now. Thank you for the question. Is that once they do the treatment, so that you'd like, say, you do three of them, and then as you go and progress with the treatments, you'll see your vision getting better and better and better. So as you get to the point that probably yourself will tell the doctor, hey doc, you know, this, this vision is great, you know, it's a good way, I've never seen this good. So you feel happy, and if you can think things get do better, you will try another time. But if you're happy, then he locks in the prescription. And when he locks it in, you don't have to worry about wearing glasses, whatever, indoor or outdoor anymore. I mean, if fashionably, you do. We, every time we get in the car, the first thing we do is the what? Put a pair of sunglasses, but aside from that, you don't have to do for medical reason anymore. So, until they lock their prescription. Yes? Depending on the in supplemental insurance you have with this 3900 is that 39 in addition to what Medicare pays? It's, in a, it's a 39 in addition to your deductibles and copay. So whatever insurance you have, I'm sure most of us have deductibles and copay unless you have these Medicare Plan F, Plan G, stuff like that. Otherwise, yeah, so the supplements yeah, those are supplement. If, let's say you have Medicare Advantage. So Medicare Advantage, we, we, we locked with the deductibles and copay. So in addition to that, you get the 3900 or the 2500 depending on the choice. 3900 per eye. Yes, per eye. But if you have a supplement. I'm sorry? Medicare supplement, not Medicare Advantage, Medicare supplement. Yeah. yeah. Plan may pay something. Yeah, no, I feel like, like I mentioned, the only two plans at the time, maybe there's another plan that does not maybe as good, but it depends on the plan. If you have any deductibles and, deduct, and, uh, uh, and the copay left, you know, those is, those is in addition to your 3900 or the 2500 I mentioned plan F because we're so familiar with the Medicare plan F because they pay everything, right? Mm -hmm. So in that case, you pay only the 3900 or the 2500 just, you know, I'll try to bring as an example just to kind of paint the picture type thing. Any, any more? Yeah? Uh, the basic plan, I would pay by Medicare, the basic first column? Yes. Medicare takes care of it. The only thing you're responsible, I mean, I point to you. <laughs> mm -hmm. We're responsible if we go with that basic. It's deductibles and copay and $65 for the drops per eye, obviously. We cool, yeah. Are the follow-up visits covered then under the yes? Umbrella now this is the, the package includes all that. You know, oh. there are three follow-up visits. I don't know if the doctor covered that, but three follow-up visits. It's one day, one week, one month. And actually, to be honest with you, we have a very strong relationship with I don't know 500, 600 optometrists around the area. And so what we do, we you come to us because sometimes 
most of the times I should say, you're recommended to come to see one of our surgeons by an optometrist. So if that's the case, you do the surgery with our doctors, but the follow-up you can do with your own optometrist. So it's a one day, one week, and it's all covered. It's paid, paid by the plan, by the plan, by the choice. The package, let's say. This is an inquisitive group. <laughs> I like that. Because otherwise it would be boring. You know, if you just listen, it's boring. <laughs> Anything else? Okay, let me tell you, let me tell you one thing. Um, I know some of you guys already had the surgery, but, and you could probably can be the testimonial for everybody else. If you had the surgery, unless you had the complications, which is rare, really, to be honest with you, these this surgeries are very safe and highly successful. So uh, it's true. Um, so the first thing you do now that you learned all this, now you got all the information, you've been educated. What's, if you've been told you have a cataract, so the next thing you have to do is to see a surgeon. A optometrist can tell you you have a cataract, but he cannot tell you what, you know, how bad it is. Most of the time, so you come and do the evaluation, they do the full exam. I'm talking about they check you for everything, including glaucoma and all that stuff. So therefore, it's being an extensive examination, those are the measurements that are taken the day that the doctor will use toward the surgery. So it's uh, important. And sometimes what happens, you come in to see the surgeons for the evaluation, and he thinks that you're not ready for cataract. Yeah, you have some, but not to the point that requires surgery. Then you, at least now you know where you are and what can be done, and you have time to study the choices. So this is a thing as a surgeon to get the quality evaluation. It's your first step toward getting the quality vision eventually after the cataract so you can start to do your normal daily tasks like you used to do. Whatever it's um, putting makeup on and uh, reading, golfing and all that stuff. So what's the next thing to do is to, do, to see a surgeon. Now I want you to know that today there's a free screening for who elected to do it and then we have uh, the technicians ready for you if you want to do it. The, the paper that you collected Pamela collected the papers. If you're interested in doing the screening, and of course, after the screening, it's not a full exam, you know, it's just to see where you are, if you have a cataract and required to see the surgeons, they'll tell you. And then you can schedule an appointment with our surgeons right there in the front, front desk on the other side. You know, this, this center is phenomenal. It's a state-of-the-art technology here. You can see that we have the Cleveland Eye Clinic next door, that's where you do the evaluation. Here they do the surgeries. And we have also LASIK Center here. They do surgery here also. So, uh, interested? anybody interested in doing the, uh, the free screening? Okay, we have one, two, three. Okay, so whoever is interested, you know, the Pamela will give you the paper, you go, you go you know, next door and you get the exam. Thank you for coming. I hope you enjoy all this. Thank you. Thank you.